It's an area that's been overlooked in the past, but now financial and payment technology companies are setting their sights on the small business underdogs and giving them the tools they need to thrive in an increasingly digital environment. It's attracting the biggest names in venture capital, it's driving conversations on a policy level, and it's just getting started. So let's dig into it. I'm Stephanie Hughes, finance reporter at Financial Post, covering topics ranging from financial services to crypto and housing and all that fun stuff. On the panel today, we have John McKinley, the CEO of Carry and a senior executive in the financial services arena, focusing on fintech payments and innovative lending products. John holds over 25 years in the IT and financial services space, leading at firms like Omers and PwC. He's doing his best to uh, join us right now. Um, and uh, also on the panel, we have Sue Britton, the co-founder of Fathom Foresight. She's been an entrepreneur in the payment space since 2015 and has spent over 25 years working for fintech giants like Finastra, Broadbridge, and Simcor. Sam Safe is the CEO of Purpose Inc. and Purpose Invests. Before leading this company, he was the investment banker at RBC Capital Markets. He's currently a member of multiple boards and committees, including the AGO Foundation Board and the Next Canada Board. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, to kick off this conversation, I really want to start on uh, more broadly about this shift on what's happening in the fintech space with regards to small business. And Sue, I wanted to start with you. Um, how would you describe this shift in the uh, fintech adoption among small businesses and what's driving these fintech companies to really start embracing these clients here? Well, thanks, Stephanie. And uh, hi, John. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we're just getting into it. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I've never seen more um, innovation and startup activity around uh, servicing small businesses needs. And, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of it is being driven by the fact that many of small businesses had to adopt digital technologies, go online, you know, various types of things um, as a result of, of the pandemic. But it also, um, you know, I think the, the number of fintechs that have launched new and innovative products has definitely um, increased. And, you know, I'm sure you're going to hear this from from Sam and uh, from John, you know, companies like theirs that are really actually servicing the small businesses with better pro better financial products. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, there was just a few um, uh, companies like that. And now there's many. And so I think, um, you know, it is for sure the hottest <laughs> space out there. And open banking is just accelerating that even further. And I think it's driving um, creating a compelling uh, or a burning platform for some of the incumbent financial institutions to, you know, step up and actually take uh, take notice and make sure that they um, can compete, uh, you know, with with some of these great new companies. Absolutely, yeah. and this is a conversation we've been having over the years. And to your point, uh, pandemic has really accelerated a lot of these topics we're having, but it hasn't always been an easy ride for many of these small businesses. Uh, John, um, can you walk us through some of the challenges that small and medium-sized businesses face when it comes to just accessing credit and capital and these products um, and maybe kind of uh, dig into why this has been the case and what has been the impact of it all? Yeah, happy to. And sorry for uh, my technical ineptitude uh, causing me to be a little late for this. But maybe what I would do is just kind of uh, reference a couple of statistics, which I think set the context for um, the way small businesses feel. Um, first of all, just in terms of uh, cr credit cards as a payment mechanism, you know, more than 60% say that they would like to uh, be using credit cards with their suppliers and vendors. Um, nearly half of SMEs who are using cards are using their personal business card, their personal cards, not a business card. Um, and 64 percent of Canadian small business owners say they'd benefit from uh, increased competition in financial services. So clearly they're uh, an underserved segment within, uh, within the, the market, within the financial uh, services market. Um, and, uh, you know, what we've observed in the analysis that we've done in terms of um, access to credit really extends beyond uh, just a, a, a fintech uh, platform per se, but also extends into credit availability. So, you, you know, an organization like ours, we have a, we have a credit card platform 
um, with all the, you know, the, the features that enhance the experience for the user in terms of, you know, administration of the program themselves, all the spend controls, uh, expense controls, and accounting integration. Um, but, you know, being able to provide intramonth liquidity is, and in the form of uh, a credit card payment is extraordinarily valuable to small businesses that, that as per the previous stats, just don't have access to uh, a robust credit card program. Um, the, the beauty of a credit card platform is that it, it actually offers um, an inherent uh, uh, operating line uh, credit structure as well through the revolving capability. Um, so we see that as a great um, additive of source of, of capital to help smooth cash flows and manage, uh, manage liquidity. So, uh, uh, you know, and we see it as a, an opportunity to do risk-based pricing at a rate structure, which really isn't very prevalent, uh, prevalent in the marketplace. But also, if you kind of think about some of the new features on, on, on many uh, card platforms, um, they offer uh, the ability to do buy now, pay later, large, largely targeted at the consumer market. Um, which in in business um, terms, that's a really an installment loan that could be uh, uh, rolled into an installment loan uh, a product for capital assets. And we get to see the spend, you know, what's happening from a spend perspective, um, look at the transaction, run it through our credit models um, and make a really uh, efficient process to offer uh, installment lending. So all of these are the types of solutions we see that um, organizations like ours can can bring to market and create, uh, you know, a whole new level of liquidity for for businesses. Absolutely. And I think um, a, a lot of this uh, access to the certain fun, uh, financing options and funding uh, has been so crucial during the pandemic. We've seen companies need to take on extra costs to kind of retrofit their businesses and then just kind of bridge the gaps between any um, loss of income. But uh, it seems like there's help on the way. We're starting to see more attention to the space from a venture capital perspective. Um, Sam, I want to put this question to you. Um, why do we see more venture capitalists uh, set their sights on the fintech space? Uh, and what's drawing their attention to the small business segment? Well, I think that, uh, first off, um, you know, the, the, the venture community is excited about fintech predominantly because it's a large industry that has, for the most part, uh, you know, hasn't been disrupted meaningfully you know, there's a lot of sort of small cosmetic disruption that's happened in the last um, call it 10, 20 years. But, you know, real deep uh, technological and customer product and experiential disruption hasn't happened yet. And so there's a lot of energy around that. Uh, and, you know, the capital always, you know, there's there's reasons why the industry has kind of been slower to be disrupted. It's, you know, predominantly regulatory structure is very different and all the rest. Um, specifically, when you get into the SMB space, I think some of the comments that John made are important. And, you know, what I'd say just to sum it really up is that the small business space is, uh, you know, one of the most, you know, I guess, large parts of our economy. We know the importance that small businesses play in driving our economy. And, and I think the pandemic, you know, highlighted that more than anything else for those who didn't know. But, but at the same time, it's probably the most unbanked component of our economy. You know, small businesses, um, uh, you know, are different than traditional consumers, you know, and, and specifically when you get into Canada um, or, you know, uh, where, where the consumer is pretty well banked in Canada, um, you know, it's very, very, you know, the banks cover them very well. And, and most people get um, access to basic financial services product. When you get into small business, the exact opposite. Majority of small businesses really don't get access to the quality of financial products um, that, that support their need, their real needs. Um, I think, you know, John's point is an important one. Um, the, the, the reason is because the number one product small businesses actually need is access to capital or credit. Um, and, and, you know, the, the reality is for the incumbent financial institutions, it's an extremely difficult product for them to provide because it's, you know, microfinance, meaning that it's very, you know, small numbers generally. I mean, you're giving $10,000, $5,000, $50,000 capital to small businesses, they don't need, you know, a million or $2 million. I mean, they'd like it, but they don't need that <laughs> to run their businesses. Um, it is generally unsecured credit, um, you know, and so you're not dealing with, um, you know, a house when you give a more like you do in a mortgage, you're not giving, you know, kind of based on assets against someone's wealth account and things like that. 
and 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 also it's um uh you know it's uh, usually it doesn't have a, a credit score you know small businesses don't have a credit score like you do in the consumer space so when you add those three things up you know it's extremely difficult for a traditional financial institution to service this community it's opened up a massive gaping hole and you know the, the fintechs love gaping holes that are large <laughs> and so they kind of try to address that and i think that's the important thing at the same time um it's also you know through technology that a large part of those problems, microfinance, um, you know, kind of using non-traditional lending, so unsecured credit uh, and speed and all the other things that are really important to small businesses actually can get solved. And so it's a logical problem to be solved by the financial technology players as opposed to, you know, just to traditional banks uh, supporting them on their own. So I think it's an exciting space. Um, there's been a you know, I'd say in the last decade, there's been a lot of energy and excitement around different components of the servicing of small businesses. And I would say the VC community is trying to figure out where is this market going to hit? Like, where is the product going to best be served? What's the call it center of gravity of servicing the small businesses? And, and you know, there was a period where credit was the number one thing. So traditional financing and loans. Um, then it went to, you know, call it payments. And I think that's a really important thing. So different forms of it, whether it's the things like the square reader or, you know, the card solutions, and, and you've got lots of energy around the cards these days. Um, and, and, you know, there's accounting is another solution. We've seen a lot of capital investing into the accounting software players. But I think that the reality is, is that it's going to be a piece of a number of things that come together. And I think the VC community is trying to figure out how to do that in a really unique way. And also, I'd say just, you know, players like ourselves and John and others are all trying to figure out how do you build that true center of gravity for small businesses to serve them uh, in a meaningful way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, this is a very exciting space. Uh, things, So many things are happening at such a rapid rate. Uh, it's been exciting for me to cover it and just see all of this kind of happen in real time. And um, appreciate you kind of speaking to the uh, VC community and how they're trying to figure out to um, actually create this uh, this hub for um, small businesses. I would imagine a lot of these uh, uh, these challenges are also kind of be being addressed uh, through policy on a policy level. So Sue, uh, could you kind of provide some um, detail here on what you're hoping to see from a policy perspective to help move the needle for small and medium sized businesses uh, to, to kind of get more, um, uh, I guess, scope in the fintech space? <clears throat> yeah. Um... Well, I mean, I, I, frankly, I think that the, uh, you know, policy is important and I think there's some, you know, work that needs to be done um, to address some of the maybe, um, you know, legacy policy that, you know, drives, you know, credit risk decisioning and things like that, that won't allow for, you know, maybe alternative data to be used. And, you know, I, I actually don't, and maybe, you know, Sam and, and uh, John are better to comment on, you know, is that a policy issue? It is for a, you know, uh, federally regulated financial institution or, or a prudentially regulated institution. But yet, at the same time, you know, Square and Shopify can, you know, do decisioning from data that they have on their platforms, which is a significant advantage for them um, with, with their financial products that they're offering. Um, but uh, open banking, I think, is one thing like and I, you know, I think um, the open banking, uh, you know, promise of open banking uh, and the inclusion of small businesses in that, I think, is really important because at the end of the day, like the, you know, the as a small business, I'm not really all that, you know, interested in spending time choosing financial products or, you know, frankly, you know, providing documentation or filling out forms and all that kind of garbage. What I actually just need is, you know, the most convenient, you know, probably digital in my case, um, but the most convenient, cost-effective, you know, always working solution. And so I think, I don't think there is a need for policy as it relates to, um, to encourage embedded finance and i think that's where we're going to see more yeah. we're going to see more more servicing of small businesses through embedded finance solutions um uh than we are going to through policy changes in my opinion 
Absolutely. Yeah, it sounds like the um, the private sector is really going to be taking the lead here. And um, and to your point about uh, open banking on um, kind of uh, providing that, uh, I guess, more of a broader range of services and more price competition, kind of to John's point earlier in the conversation, that is a crucial uh, next step for uh, just broadening out the pool and uh, allowing more players in the industry. And um, uh, definitely from a small business perspective, that's going to be essential to kind of creating, um, I guess, this positive feedback loop to uh, further innovating and um, further building out the um, economy. Uh, so when it comes to the fintechs, uh, John, uh, what are fintechs doing differently from other incumbents when it uh, comes to supporting small businesses with products and access to capital? It, beyond just giving a broader scope of uh, products, uh, what is it? why is it so important that they're taking an active uh, uh, stance in this space? And what are the impacts we're seeing? Yeah, well, um, it, it's all enabled by open banking, by the by the way, and, and what Sue was talking about in terms of, of of data. So, just kind of from a poli- you know, from a business policy and a risk policy perspective, uh, being able to do cash flow analysis and create synthetic uh, uh, P and Ls and cash flows of the businesses is incredibly important to be able to. Uh, assess credit worthiness and credit capacity, seasonality, and risk-based pricing. Um, so, um, you know, all this is only enabled by uh, data, external data, um, and then over time that data becomes rich within a fintech, and um, you really kind of create your own uh, credit models based on your experience with that data. So um, data is the lifeblood of, of um, in, you know, what I would call c- creating this capacity in, in the marketplace, um, being able to do, you know, rich cash flow analysis and, and, and then having the ability to monitor that is really important as well. And again, through analytics and uh, open banking, accounting data, rec- you know, being able to reconcile that just gives you so much more insights uh, in terms of being able to optimize uh, what what uh, our clients need from a credit perspective. So that's an important part. And that, I mean, the banks have a lot of that data, um, but, you know, their comfort, maybe to Psalm's earlier point, their comfort with being able to do cash flow analysis and, uh, you know, um, creating a full, full digital experience that allows you to kind of continuously monitor uh, credit worthiness is is extremely important, and that's unique. That's not that doesn't happen today in the uh, in the banking system. It only happens uh, in the fintech ecosystem. You know, I would, I would, I would just add that um, you know, look, I, I think that this hope for open banking is uh, is a really <laughs> I mean, everyone snickered, it, but that's the reality. Is that you know we we sit here and and I think we all can see a world where you know. Um, proper regulatory uh, oversight in terms of a, a new regime uh, of, of kind of breaking down the proprietary walls of, 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 the, of the incumbents and those who have those data banks um, and creating that opportunity to service the, the customer differently and better. And I think Sue's point that small businesses should, you know, be incorporated into that mindset. Um, it, it's a very powerful thing. However, you know, if you actually look at the reality of, of, of what we sort of face ahead of us, years. I just don't see it being, um, you know, in our, in our window of opportunity of time in the next five to seven years, a reality. And, um, and, and so, you know, what, what we have to do as business leaders and, you know, as, as innovators is we have to solve these problems independent of the regulatory and the government call it, you know, involvement. I think the, um, the, the pandemic, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll spend some time on it too was a really great example of where what I say that we need to do is change the mindset of our regulators and, and our government officials. You know, and I think, so you touched on something that was important around, call it, you know, um, things like where, you know, KYC and AML and, and uh, access to um, different forms of kind of thinking about um, uh, these types of efforts is, it's got to change. Um, you know, I spent, we spent a lot of time <laughs> trying and help, you know, support, offering to support our government in accessing, um, or allowing them to access small businesses in a meaningful way, which is, of course, the biggest problem that small businesses faced in 
in the midst of the pandemic during the shutdowns uh, were, you know, how do I get access to the government support and credit that they were basically providing? How does the government get that money to them? And, you know, the agency of what we just talked about was, you know, in the consumer side, it was very easy to go through, you know, the banks, you know, they have the bank accounts for 90 plus percent of all Canadians, and they can just deposit that right into the accounts. It was very simple. But when it came to small businesses, they didn't serve small businesses. Gaping hole we talked about. So, yeah. you know, what I found really difficult was a lack of recognition by, you know, our government that the existing channels of agency to support small businesses were not prepared for the moment. And yet a lack of desire to work with the fintechs effectively to do so. Whereas yeah. everywhere else in the world, in yeah. the US, Australia, UK, the governments engaged with the fintechs immediately. And what did that do? It strengthened the fintech sector. It helped mm -hmm. them during a period of difficulty as well to support the small businesses and get quick and easy access to government support to the to the community. And it it, it changed the the uh, sort of makeup mm -hmm. of the support. And so, you know, in, in the conversations with everyone from, you know, um, uh, our ministers of small business to minister of uh, science and technology to minister of finance, what I would say is that we struggled specifically in the finance department at them mm -hmm. recognizing that different can be better as opposed to different is 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 worse mm -hmm. and um and i would say that that's what we need to change the mindset and so if there is anything regulatory and call it policy that needs to change is that the psyche that technology driven and na data native type of thinking actually can be better and Fr frankly, you know, it's the same people who will go and shop on Amazon and, and, and you know, mm -hmm. go on to different types of, you know, really amazing technology driven companies and every other part of our past of our lives. But when it comes to financial services, I think we, you know, they struggle to understand why, you know, doing it differently is actually better. And so yeah. a lot of work in this country that needs to be done. And it starts with our government officials recognizing that financial technology <clears throat> players are going to be a part of the pro part of the solution of the future, not a part of, uh, you know, a side player and, you know, uh, and the banks and the, the central actors. Yeah, and one one really quick comment just to add to that, because um, uh, some work we uh, did that ultimately had us talking to some of SOM's team, um, and, and it was for for a government entity. Uh, there was no, dis no difference between a FinTech and an incumbent in actually how they, you know, all the criteria that are, um, you know, audited or or um, required to be followed for a financial institution are followed by fintechs. And, you know, other than the fact that there is no prudential regulator of them, you know, all of the, the there was no reason to say that they were any less, um, you know, uh, less capable. In fact, if, if, to Sam's point, they were more capable because of the technology and the, you know, automation and the sophistication of actually probably following the regulations, to be honest with you. But, um, and I just say that because I think, you know, while it's probably not public information, there are probably more small businesses that were served by fintechs and alternative lenders and companies like John's through the pandemic than there were from the banks. Uh, setting aside the automatic, you know, bank driven, um, driven funding. And it's just very frustrating to hear policymakers and regulators talk about fintechs as being high risk or creating, you know, systemic risk because it's, it's just not true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I pile on, on that one? Um, <laughs> because, um, you know, I've experienced a lot of frustration as well, kind of at the conceptual level, but, you know, even, you, you know, our governments have created crown corporations that are meant to stimulate the, the small business, uh, economy and community and you know a platform like ours or psalms represents a perfect vehicle for doing that right deploying that capital um, in an efficient effective way with great controls um, around things like AML KYC or KYB um, and uh, you know I just can't believe that um, people aren't you know the crown corporations aren't beating down our door to to try to use our, our platform as one to deploy capital it's just it boggles the mind given the stated policy of wanting to support small business more and more wanting to support small business it's right there for the taking 
For sure. And why do you think um, this hesitation kind of came up from uh, from these crown corporations or, the, or, or from like a policy perspective? Like, is there any kind of theory why they might not be banging down the doors or because it, it sounds like this would have been a, a really useful tool during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I I would love to jump in on that one first, if you don't mind. It's the um, like it, it's the incumbent versus the startup or it's the, you know, the rules and the and the process processes and and you know how big businesses run it's very difficult to change that and i think frankly in our work with some of the incumbents i mean it's not for lack of maybe interest in wanting to um, explore some of these ideas but the at the end of the day it's it usually comes down to it's just too hard too much technology investment too many you know policies and procedures that have to change perceived risks with regulation um and i think one of the things i hope we talk about is the fact that you know none of this really applies to square shopify paypal um into it any of those other organizations and they all are very 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 quickly servicing our needs as small businesses in fact i'm way more likely to be banking with one of those um, companies than I am with a financial institution in the very short term. Mm. So the problem, the, the good thing is that's great for me as a small business, but that's not great for, you know, fintechs and other, um, you know, companies who, have, who are bringing great solutions to market because uh, I think they're going to be potential at, at risk. Exactly. Yeah. And we hear a lot of these names during the pandemic. Shopify was a big one. Um, and this is kind of a more general question to open it up. Uh, how much of a uh, an accelerator in this area was the pandemic? Um, can we look at that as a case study moving forward, saying this was um, a case study where these fintechs really went to bat for small businesses and we had positive outcomes? Um, has that really kind of changed the conversation around this? Uh, Sam, you kind of touched on this. Uh, do you want to kind of expand on your thoughts on how the pandemic really uh, hopefully changed the conversation? Well, well, I, I, again, you know, I think that um, I think it was a missed opportunity. I think that's what I would say. Um, it, the The pandemic, um, you know, was a really interesting. I mean, as we say, it was it was a direct hit to these small and medium sized enterprises, the ones that were most um, uh, you know impacted by lockdowns and and forced shutdowns and all the rest of it. And so um, they had to adapt rapidly, and you know the service providers that service them had to adapt very rapidly. But if you if you just look at the law of large numbers, you know I go back to my comment, like the, the, a large part of uh, the livelihood of a small business is their ability to meet kind of cash flow gaps on a day to day basis, not a quarter by quarter, or year over year. It's day to day. So will I have money in my bank account on Tuesday of next week? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is a big issue. And the mm -hmm. reality is that, um, you know, the, 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 if you go to traditional, call it, the, the, let's say you rely on traditional models of lending, when you have a forced shutdown and the business is adapting, you know, and it's business revenues go off the table, there is only one lender who can be there. And that was the government, right? There, there was only one, like no one else, Square, Shopify, them, but at the end of the day, no one's going to give capital to a business that's doing this. The only one who can do that is the government, right? And so they, the intent was, let's get capital and fill that gap. And for those who were impacted by the, the pandemic, but again, I go back to, you know, you know, you're going through the wrong funnel to do so. And so it was a very disjointed, poorly executed model. Okay. But, but I, if I look at the financial technology players, I actually think that what the pandemic did because the government wasn't there because the government didn't engage them, it forced them to kind of, you know, figure out their businesses really, really efficiently and effectively and figure out more about what the actual challenge is and how to get very precise with it. And so, you know, I know in our case, in many cases, we, we built a better business coming out of the pandemic because we, we had to, I mean, you had to fight, you know, our customers were, you know, 50% of our customers were effectively un underlying bankrupt, right? I mean, that's the way you think about it. So you had to fight through that, you had to work through it, and you got to the other side in a better place. But, you know, at the end of the day, it wasn't because the, the party that should have been supportive was there. And, 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 you know, frankly, I think that's a missed opportunity by our, by our government and by our industry. I think I go back to, 
you know, I think we could have made, I mean, if you go to the U S and you go to UK and you go to Australia, um, those markets, the small business fintech players probably got stronger through the pandemic. Whereas yeah. I think the, um, the Canadian players have to get better or they die. Yeah. And it was forced that way, but the industry didn't get stronger per se. And, and I think that's the, that's the weakness. And in fact, it's actually, you know, one of the things we've talked a lot about is I think what it did, um, you know, if you really believe that we're trying to build a intellectual property driven future of our society, you know, it, 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 this is the kind of moments that, you know, on a relative basis, Canada could have, you know, become a strong player globally. If you have strong fintech players, you have strong, you know, technology uh, industry, they become the players that can go around the world and, and acquire and, and absorb and partner and do these things. But in fact, the other way happens is that, you know, all of a sudden you have U.S. players that are strengthened and Canadian players are weakened. And so we look like we're the, the targets to be taken. And so it's a really it's a really fascinating kind of thing where we'll see it play out over the next kind of couple of years. But I think that the pandemic could have been a really powerful moment. Now, one last point I want to say is for the small businesses, I think the pandemic, you know, um, kicked them in the ass so hard. And I don't mean to use that language, but like kicked them in the ass so hard that they had to adapt. That was an amazing thing because they couldn't rely on the government. They couldn't rely on all these things. They had to adapt. And so what's mm -hmm. amazing is, and this is the inspiring thing that I love about small businesses every day is why, you know, we do what we do is because these are, you know, people who wake up every day and are just trying to put food on the table or pursue their passion. And when you think about it, they had to adapt during one of the most challenging periods in history for their businesses, business models. And they did. And, and many of them have come out, they figured out e-commerce strategies, they figured out new, new revenue models. Uh, new distribution and client experiences. They fit, figured these things out because they were forced to. And I think that that's a positive too, I think, to strengthen hopefully our entrepreneurial network of small business owners. Absolutely. The, 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 the one comment I would add to that, Sam, which was my observation and having been, um, you know, a company born during the pandemic, um, on, only knowing um, uh, remote, uh, remote working and, and whatnot, um, is, is really the, the fact that, um, uh, during, but not related to the pandemic has been this advent and advance of, of, uh, great technology. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, now and only now, you know, can you see the development of, you know, screen scraping in, in open banking technologies, um, accounting integration type technologies, which allow you to do deeper analytics, uh, digital receipt capture, um, and the ability um, to ubiquitously kind of draw upon some of those components, which are so important to a, a platform like ours. Um, it, it feels like it's only now that it's really mature, that technology, and able to be stitched together in a way that creates, uh, creates a solution. So a little bit of a different spin on the pandemic, uh, but the evolution of uh, great companies that provide great service. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, when I was uh, when, during the onset of the pandemic, when I was over at BN and Bloomberg, I was having these conversations with small business owners, and um, it was such a shock just seeing everything shut down. It was such a surreal environment, but. Um, to Salm's point, I was always so impressed by the dynamism and just their ability to adapt. And um, and uh, unfortunately, this is probably underscored by uh, the lack of reliable resources that were available to them at the time. But I have to say, I was really impressed by the creativity, the um, uh, mm -hmm. just how quickly people were able to respond. Um, and uh, before I, uh, Sue, I get your uh, kind of opinion on uh, pandemic as uh, an accelerator here, I just wanted to let uh, the audience know that if you have a question uh, to ask uh, our, our very wise speakers here. There's a um, uh, speaker box there. You can just uh, send your questions along. But Sue, what uh, what were some of your takeaways when this, with this pandemic and how it kind of accelerated this uh, this fintech? Yeah, because yeah, I feel like in some ways, we, you know, this this feels like it was a bit of a, of a negative tone. And yet, at the end of the day, I still really believe that um, we are sitting at the you know probably the best time. Um, in the financial markets in Canada for businesses to be served, you know, um, by innovative new players, small businesses to be served by innovative new players. And, and I think um, just, I think what, what technology has done um, because of our 
you know, frankly need to be able to communicate and transact and, um, and deliver to, you know, on clients expectations, like technology is just now it's table stakes. And so I, I think, you know, the future of the small business financial services market is going to be, you know, a technology um, play more than it is a financial play. Like, uh, and John, I know this is part of what, you know, having talked to you offline a little bit, like you, your partners are going to give you the opportunity to embed yourself into, you know, their customer um, and distribution channels. And, um, and I think, I think that's brilliant, right? Like the, a small business that doesn't have to actually even really have to learn about <laughs> the difference between, you know, cash flow or, or, you know, assets and liabilities and profit and loss. And, and, you know, I, I can tell you the next date that we're running our payroll because we'll have a meeting probably the six days before and decide whether or not we can. And like, I don't want to know about any of that stuff. I just want to do what I'm passionate about. So I think technology is enabling that. And I hope that the pandemic, I don't think the pandemic's going to change the trajectory of things. I think the fact that it's, you know, in some areas, like I, I'm in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, momentarily for, for something um, uh, personally. And I took my dad to the farmer's market this morning, my 77 year old father, Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, population of 2,600, very much remote, uh, beautiful. Um, but in the farmer's market, every single person had a square reader. So, yeah. you know, and these are people, you know, this like woman and her mom selling, you know, uh, homemade Jamaican patties. Like, so I, and I say that because it's, 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 you know, this is a place where there is no digital, like there is no Uber, there is no grocery delivery, there is no nothing, but yet the farmer's market, small businesses got a square reader. So anyway, I think that this is um, the pandemic, you know, if there's one silver lining, it's that, you know, to Sam's point and to John's point that small businesses are going to be in a much better solid footing to weather whatever comes next. Yeah, you know, the actually, before I uh, give a bit of a response, you, sh you should know that there's a, a close connection with all three of us to uh, Nova Scotia and the South Shore. Sam's got a place there and I'm, I'm from there, but I digress. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, I, I really, uh, I, I really feel like liquidity is, is the, the thing that has to come into the fintechs and whether it comes from the banks and I've, I've got a lot of, uh, hope and aspiration that, um, the banks get their head around leading the way towards, uh, open APIing into platforms like, uh, like ours and Psalms. Um, and provide liquid, provide that liquidity. And um, the, I'm just not seeing a massive influx of that liquidity. Um, and, and that, you know, that not just throttles the growth of the fintechs, but, um, you know, th this incredibly important part of our economy, it's, you know, it's, it's the right thing for our governments and banks to do for small businesses, but it's just, it's where well, there's so much upside and so much opportunity for the economy and uh, to make the lives better of the entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, uh, small businesses employ 70% of uh, Canadians uh, who, who are employed. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's just a massive, massive opportunity, but is is only stimulated by liquidity. For sure. Uh, and the, these are all really excellent points. Um, we're kind of down to our last five minutes here, but I, I kind of have, um, one last uh, question, kind of a rapid fire round, because uh, we're talking about the the hurdles, the what went well, what could have been better. Where do we go from here? Um, I, I mean, we, we're seeing the issues, but uh, what, what needs to be addressed? What do what should we actually all be doing, whether it's on the policy level, VC level? Um, how, what does Canada need to do to kind of drive this forward and make things better? Um, so I'm, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of um, things that I think still are to be uncovered. I mean, the, the, the simple point is that we have a very, um, uh, you know, unaddressed market that remains unaddressed. And um, and so it's a large market, um, even even to Sue's point, like, yes, yeah, square readers, but, but you have to be a merchant, you know, for that to be a valuable construct. So they, they can only service a small component of the, the, yeah. the addressable uh, small business community. 
The key is how do you address the entire community? You address the entire community. Um, you know, I think that we still have to figure out the, the center of gravity. Uh, that's going to be an important thing. So we, what is the actual thing that small businesses um, need the most from financial services? And how do we get it to them in the most efficient and speedy way? Um, I continue to believe capital is the one thing that's persistent across the uh, small business community, you know, to allow them to run their capital, their, their, their actual day to days. And, um, and so that's going to be an important principle. Uh, and how do you do that in a really efficient way? Um, but at the same time, to, to, you know, there's many ways to do so. Um, and the types of products, the types of solutions that can address that journey of the small business. And we're thinking a lot about that. Mm. I think there's more innovation to be done around the data. Uh, I think John's point. And, you know, I, I just, I don't believe, I'm cynical on the incumbents opening up their APIs. I just am, and John, you come from that world too. So you, I, I think you are too, but we'll keep pushing. We'll keep, keep driving it, keep doing everything we can. Um, yeah. yeah, but I think that uh, I'm cynical to it. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the more we can get government to, to understand the gaps that are sitting there today and be, you know, I, I always, you know, say that, you know, I wish more government officials actually were small business owners. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I wish, I wish they understood, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. if, if, if they're so representative, Feel the pain. yeah, if they were so <laughs> representative of our entire economy and such a, you know, cause you've got call it people who work for the government and then you've got small business owners that make up the rest of the economy mostly. Um, and so the, the, the reality is, is that I wish that more people that were running small businesses um, went into government to help change the perspective, because I think we could change the way that we service and support the entire ecosystem. For sure. And Sue, where do we go from here? Well, I don't, I, I am equally as concerned about incumbents um, being able to open up APIs or partner. And I think, I think what we need is um, there's some momentum right now amongst the smaller financial institutions and the bigger credit unions um, to, you know, kind of drive the innovation in this area um, uh, as well as, you know, um, the, the fintechs and, uh, and the tech companies. And I think, I think we need actually some players that can actually make those connections between all of those. Um, because I think that's one of the things that's lacking in Canada is platform providers or partnership platforms, things that can, you know, reduce drastically reduce the time it takes for, you know, someone like, like a company like Carrie to get embedded in, you know, I don't know, a, uh, EQ bank. I don't know. I'm making that, but you know what I mean? Like whether it's that or into it or, or Canadian Western bank or who, who, whomever, um, that we need some, we need some solutions to make that easier. Mm, absolutely. Um, and, uh, we're a bit tight for time. Uh, John, uh, you did, uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> give us some ideas on, uh, what we should be kind of looking at, um, in, uh, some of your comments earlier. Uh, and thank you again, everybody for, um, really just kind of walking me through this and thank you to all the panelists for attending. And I'd like to thank everyone um, in the audience for tuning in. Um, I hope you all learned a lot. I certainly did. I think this was a really uh, engaging conversation about uh, which what we've learned during the pandemic and what and how much kind of runway we still have to kind of go through. I hope everybody has a great day and enjoy the rest of the panels. Thanks, great. everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.